Hi guys, my name is Karthik and I am from EasyRAutomation.com and welcome to another video from EasyRAutomation. And today we'll be talking about event-driven architecture and understanding its basics. So before starting to understand the event-driven architecture, let's first talk about the classical system that we have been dealing most of our time and then how the classical system or the monolith system is being transitioned into microservices and how now the microservices are using the event-driven architecture to consume the message and how they are actually scaling up so well and handling the data in much easier fashion. So as you can see, most of our applications start with consuming an API services and these API services will then be consuming the database, something like this. Probably they will have something like a failover service, which is going to communicate with the databases to consume the data and stuff. But yes, this is how the three tier architecture of our normal application looks like. They are also called as a big gigantic monolith systems because the reason being they are going to be relying on a particular server, which is going to have all the business logics. And even though they are split into different APIs, they still are going to be consuming uh, probably the same database or maybe sitting in different database servers for the failover and different tables probably. But it's going to be looking pretty much like a big gigantic system. And that's why these are called as monolith systems itself. But then comes what is called as a microservice architecture. With microservice architecture, we're gonna pretty much have exactly all these same things that you are seeing over here, like applications, API, failover service, and databases. But just that instead of these APIs running in one server, probably they will be running as a small microservices and they will be performing certain actions based on what is that you're gonna be doing. For example, if you're doing the login service, then you will have a login microservice. And similarly, if you're doing some inventory operation, then you will have an inventory microservices. So I'm taking everything quite simple for understanding purpose, but in real time for enterprise who are scaling up, the terms will be bit different, but I'm just going to make it more simple this time. So what's going to basically happen is all these microservices are going to be uh, running in the uh, Docker container and they also will be running in the probably in the Kubernetes and these applications will be probably sitting inside the Kubernetes as a pod uh, and then they will be running from there. And because these are all going to be running in different microservices and because each and every microservices are going to perform certain actions, they will have a separate SQL server database as well. So this service will be consuming this database service and he'll be using this database service and this service will be using another database service, something like this, and he'll be probably using this database service. So you got the idea, right? Like, so this is how the whole communications are going to happen. So if a particular application is going to be performing certain actions, then he is going to be calling this API service, which is running over here, or he may be calling this API service, or he may be calling an API service, which will be running on this particular uh, server. And then all these communications are going to happen over here, like processing, and probably they will also have what is called as the failover logics and stuff. So you can see that all these things that is happening at the moment are going to be like diverse like all these microservices are going to be performing these actions for us and they will ha all have like all these uh, big pieces split into smaller microservices and in fact because they are going to be running in the docker container there also requires a monitoring of the health checks and also they also requires the health check of the database service they also require the health check and probably even the analytics information of what's happening on a particular system. So probably we'll also be monitoring all these things on these systems. And we also might have observability of how these particular service behaves in a given point of time and how these systems are going to be available for the user at a any given point of time. And even though our services are split into microservices, there are situations that they are designed in such a way that these microservices will be dependent on each other. And then it becomes like a synchronous operation, rather asynchronous operation. There may be even situation where if an API completes a processing, only the data which is required by the processed API will be used by another API server to perform certain action. So that becomes a big splitted gigantic monolithic microservice architecture and that becomes even more harder as well. So in order to resolve all these problems that we have in terms of accessing the data and also performing certain actions that we are doing in terms of accessing the 
data from an application and using the API service, we should be using what is called as a event driven architecture. So event driven architecture have grown in popularity because they help address some of the inherent challenge in building the complex system commonly used in modern organizations. The approach promotes the use of microservices, which are small, specialized services performing a narrow set of functions. A well-designed Lambda-based application incompatible with the principles of microservice architecture might be helpful as well. Well, this text is something I took from the AWS website, so you can even go ahead and see that. But this particular definition looks pretty well. And in fact, using the event-driven architecture, there are many benefits available. Something like we can be replacing the polling and webhook with events, replacing the complexity of the system, improving the scalability and extensibility of the system, and real-time analytics and stuff. But you might be wondering, like, this is exactly what you can do even in the microservices architecture. So how does it differ in the event-driven architecture? The only difference comes with the event-driven architecture, as I told you, is to solve the problem with the data access that you are seeing over here. So at the moment, like we have multiple connectivity with this API to a SQL Server database because they're gonna be performing certain business actions and then getting the responses back. And then another API is gonna be uh, using that particular response from the API to be used over here. And each and every API is dependent on another API which is even more chaotic because if a particular API is down, then probably the another API is not going to perform an action. And because the another API is not going to perform any action, so all these APIs are going to be down and your whole system is again going to be down even though they are split into microservices. So to resolve this problem, we are going to be splitting our architecture something like these. All right, so this is the super simple event driven architecture, which is using the event streaming platform. And now you may be asking, what is this event streaming platform that we are using? We're actually using a Kafka over here. It can be a rabbit MQ or it can be anything that you are interested in. But the pipe that you are seeing over here is actually an event streaming platform. And that's what we are using here so that all the services can communicate. And in this case, we are using Kafka. So what is this Apache Kafka is all about? This Apache Kafka is a community distributed event streaming platform capable of handling trillions of events per day. Initially conceived as a messaging queue, Kafka is based on an abstraction of a distributed commit logs. Since being created and open sourced by LinkedIn in 2011, Kafka has quickly evolved from messaging queue to a full-fledged event streaming platform. And that's what it is currently doing. But now, while we see this particular definition, like it's completely copy-pasted from the Kafka website itself, what is this event streaming platform and what are the things that we really need to know about while we talk about the event-driven architecture? The first thing that comes into mind while talking about this particular definition is events and event streaming. So what is this event? So in this context of application that we were talking about, event simply are things that happens within a software system. These things can be a user detail updated, credit card details updated or changed, phone number details deleted, something like that. So these are the things or the events which happens. And these above events can be interested to some party, like services in our case, and this will trigger another set of actions. And these actions can be one party's interested event or group of parties, and those parties will then be triggering another set of events too. So this is like a chain of events keep going on, and that's how the events are going to happen. So most like, if there is any changes happen within your system, the system will trigger an event, and that event is going to be stored as a topic in the event streaming platform. And once again, to go even further, the microservice architecture that we saw earlier, even before this event-driven architecture, it was actually dependent on each other, like by waiting for another API to respond. And that pattern that I used to call it as like an ask and wait pattern, because an API ask for an, another API or a service to process certain operation and only if that particular API returns the response, then the API is happy or the service is happy to deliver it to the intended recipient. 
So that's like an ask and wait. And there is going to be a wait period over there. Like an API has to respond so that the other API can work together without any problem. But in the event driven architecture or in the event streaming architecture, the pattern is completely reverse. Here, each service will tell what event has occurred. If other service is interested in the event, they will get it. Or if not, they will be in queue forever. So that event will be in the queue forever. So this pattern is called as tell and get pattern. Probably tell or get pattern because the service is going to tell that the phone number has been changed. That's it. And it don't worry about whether the other service is really processing that updated things or not. It doesn't matter. But it just tells that this event has occurred. So that naturally comes to this question of how these events are going to be processed by other services and how these data are going to be streamed in this event driven architecture or event streaming platform. So streaming of data means a constant flow of data, each containing information about an event or change of state. The streaming data is processed in real time as it is delivered to the system. Although the type of data or the nature of the event typically will affect any resulting action. For example, user details updated, credit card details changed, phone number deleted. So all these are events and these has to be processed. And this is what is this event streaming platforms are going to do. Well, talking about this event streaming platform and how these services are going to be performing this action that naturally brings up our services to be in two state mostly. One is the producer and another one is the consumer. So the producer is going to produce a event, for example, phone number updated. And he's going to be putting that information or the event in a topic in the Kafka queue. And that particular information will sit on this particular topic forever, unless until a consumer is going to consume this particular event. And there may be one consumer or there may be multiple consumer to consume this particular topic. But you can see that all the information or the events that is produced by a service is going to be sitting on a topic of the Kafka and then it's going to be consumed by the consumer. And that's exactly what is going to happen within our microservice architecture as well as you see over here. All it's trying to do is each and every API will act like a producer or a consumer and it is going to be performing certain action or producing an event. For example, this application is going to be like a e-commerce application. And if this particular application user is changing the user detail, then it is going to call its relative API from one of the service which is running within the platform. And that is going to say, all right, this user has changed the user details. So that's going to be an event which is going to be created and stored somewhere on a topic on this event streaming platform like Kafka. And then there will be another API which will keep listening for a topic for any user detail has been updated or not. So if there is a change in the topic which the API is interested in is keep listening and if there is a change happens then this particular API is going to say all right the user detail has been changed so let me go and change into the relative database which is sitting somewhere over here on one of the cloud services. So that's how the things are going to happen. So you can see that the idea of this event driven architecture is a bit reverse well compared to the classical way of thinking of how the APIs actually work. And that's exactly is the major difference between event driven architecture versus the classical APIs and service accessing the data in the platform itself. So that's it guys. This is the basics of event driven architecture. And I have already built an application with the event driven architecture, which runs on a Docker container and it's all spinned up using a Docker compose file, as you can see over here, and it uses a rabbit MQ and it also spins up a customer and an inventory user. And it all does things and asynchronously like updating the product information and consumer using the product information and updating the product details and the customer details on the fly based on the events being triggered. So it's all developed using .NET core and stuff, which I'll probably show as a demo in our upcoming video in our extra dimension channel. But yes, this is what is event driven architecture. And this is the basics of event driven architecture and hope you really understand how the event driven architecture works and the real reason of companies moving towards event driven architecture. That's it guys. Once again, thank you very much for watching this video and you guys have a great day.